Hello there. Good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of the Native Wellness Institute Power Hour. <laughs> I hope you're having an awesome morning. Well, now we're in the afternoon. And uh, my name is Robert Johnston. And I just want to be sharing some thoughts with you today. First of all, um, just want to welcome anyone who's new to the Native Wellness Institute Power Hours. This is something that we've been doing now for over a year, and this is our response to the pandemic. And one of the things we wanted to do is provide positive messages and just share a little bit more of what we do as far as our work, give you a little bit of insight behind uh, the, the facilitators, the trainers, the staff of NWI. And as we approach um, coming up into uh, this month of April, well, we're in April, but as we, you know, as we approach this mid-April, one of the things that um, I start to find myself being more thankful for, and I look back a year ago, and a year ago, um, it was tough. It was really tough uh, for anyone who's used to um, visiting, and socializing and being around a lot of people. You know, uh, um, for me on a personal matter, I my work involves me being at events, being around people, being around lots of good energy. And when we hit a point where not only where we, that was not gonna happen anymore, we couldn't do that anymore. Uh, there was no sight or insight to how long that would be. So we're talking a real, a real, uh, a, a scary time. And I was looking at some uh, pictures this morning and just going back to that. And, and I think it really hits on what I wanted to share uh, today because what I realized is that um, what was, I was being overcome with a lot of emotion during that time. And when you're overcome with a lot of emotion, what happens is that our emotion is linked to a lot of things, uh, specific emotions. Uh, for example, you know, say if there's an emotion, we don't usually feel a lot. And one of those emotions, when you're around a lot of people, maybe one of the emotions that you don't feel a lot is um, that loneliness, feeling like you're alone, feeling like you're by yourself, that and isolation, you know, cause that to happen. Well, with every memory that we have, with every life experience that we have that's stored up here in our brains, we get an attachment. And that attachment is associated with the physical part of the world, like the smells and the sights and the sounds of it, but also with uh, your, your emotional response to that. And when we experience that emotion, we always think of maybe something triggering an emotion, but emotion can be a trigger as well. And it can trigger uh, memories. It can trigger memories. And it, and it put me back to a time where I felt mentally I was really lost and um, experienced uh, some issues when it comes to uh, mental health. And I think that's one of the things that I really wanted uh, to speak about today, because when we talk about mental health, um, a lot of times we just focus on what is considered um, healthy and unhealthy. But what we don't consider is the thought processing behind it. And <clears throat> when we look at certain things that our ancestors did, uh, we were very focused on uh, nurturing the mental health and as well as the other parts of it too, the emotional, the physical, the spiritual. So the last time I was on here, I talked about, um, and, 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 and just to let you know, this is also a continuation of the discussion I had last time, which is about uh, healthy human development. And I love that subject from an indigenous perspective because I do think our ancestors were experts at human development, at, at the human qualities of life that are needed to not only survive, but to thrive in, in this world that we live in. 
you know, putting ourselves in a connection always with everything, with our thoughts are in line, that our, our energy is in line, that our spirit is in line uh, with our ancestral uh, um, past, because that's where the true connection is in this world. So um, I want to do a couple of shout outs there. I see Arnold is here. Thank you for joining us, Arnold. I see Steven is on. Thank you for joining us. And yeah, when you jump on, give us give us a shout out. You know, your name, where you're from, your tribe, because it's always good uh, to put up there. It's always good to see who's listening in today. So um, I'm going to bring up uh, this slide. And this is something that I talked about and shared last time. But uh, it's one... This is uh, put together by Charlie Tail Feathers, and people love this, and I love it too, because it really describes that life passage, and it really describes the process of human development. Um, and if you look at this uh, life cycle and rites of passage, to and, and I went in more depth on my last uh, Power Hour about, you'd say, the early part of the years, the the uh, infant up to about right here. And I put a lot of focus on the storytelling years and the storytelling years is how we form our core belief systems that are going to be our guide uh, throughout. And some people would call it our, poor, our core morality. And yes, uh, you know, I would agree to that somewhat during that, that time. And why is that is because, you know, during that time, we, we, our brain can't judge what is right or wrong. Our brain only judges what is accepted, meaning what behaviors are rewarded and what behaviors are punished. Uh, our brains are not yet able to look at um, circumstances and situationals and, 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 and see how we, uh, um, how we apply that, how we apply judgment on something. It's more about, okay, you're told not to do this, so you don't do this, or you're told this is how we do it. But it's also what we see and what we see is the norm and what we see is more powerful than what we're told. So even though we might be told, um, you know, when we think about maybe that uh, uh, alcoholic uh, that we know as kids and they hold up that drink and say, don't you do this, don't you be like me. Um, yeah, the words are trying to tell us to avoid this, but even that image is more powerful than the words, you know, that image is more powerful than the words as for that growing brain. And so that's what we talked about last time. And what, uh, and, and we also talk about that idea of when we look at here, that 10 to 15, that idea of being able to take what we had and start to own it for ourselves, start to form our own identity that our brain goes through this uh, change and it's a, a biological change. And it's important that our brain goes through that biological change so that we can accommodate uh, the, uh, the neurology of transformation. And when we are, and, and when we have that process happen, um, our thinking changes and how we think changes. And then we start to groom that type of thinking through processes, through rites of passages. And this is how, you know, again, this is just a look at how we did things traditionally. And I love sharing this because I think it, uh, points to a couple of things. One of the things I think it points to is uh, how sacred children were and how sacred humans were and, and, and how important the development of all it is. It is. And I, I mean, to me, that's exciting. The other part that I get really excited about when we share this uh, model here is uh, one second. I got to do a click here. Uh, a couple of things. One of the things I think, oh, how was a recording? Okay, there we go. That way I can see some of the comments. I had to change the settings here so I, had to, so I can see some of your comments when they come in. But uh, the other exciting thing that I think is that as we look at this and, and know that, you know, this, uh, our way of thinking was really studied by a lot of uh, behavioral scientists, psychologists, and that set the foundation for what we know as modern day psychology. You know, they looked at our people. And again, it, all, it goes to something that I always believe that science is trying to catch up with what our ancestors already knew when it comes to social science, when it comes to human development and, and so forth. So 
Um, this is exciting to me, and I hope that you can feel that same excitement as, as you look at a model like this. And again, you know, the man behind this, and those of you that know the man behind this model, Charlie Tailfeathers, um, this is his life's work. When I say his life's work, not just in a classroom studying or not by a case study, but by living it, right? By living it, by living it, by teaching it, by, by learning more about it and by experience it, by experiencing all of this. And uh, to see him so excited, you know, one of the, one great memory I'll always remember out Charlie is being able to travel to Australia with him and listening to the type of questions that he asked, they're, they're, they're not the type of questions that we would normally ask when we go to Australia, you know, like, you know, where can we uh, get some kangaroo stew <laughs> or something like that? Or where is the opera house? You know, that's typical when you go to Australia, ask questions like that. But his questions always had to do with this, always had to do with rites of passages, always had to do with um, um, what are the teachings about this or uh, the healing practices, you know, and, and so forth. Everywhere we went, he wanted to learn. And so again, with human development, when we look at human development, we look at cultural teachings, all of them differ in how they teach it. But what's in line with there with all the human development is the teachings. And hopefully I, I say, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in all the types of human development, but what hopefully is the core there is that understanding that we have a connection there, that we have a connection with the world. We have a connection with the world's resources. We have a connection um, with the world as a home base, uh, the same that all the animals have, the same that all of um, the elements have, we're all consistent with that. You know, just like the fire needs oxygen to grow, we need oxygen to breathe. So, you know, that idea of relationship thinking, right? So we're gonna talk about this and uh, a little bit more about indigenous thinking. So what is indigenous thinking? You know, what is indigenous thinking? And, and I, I, you know, I, I think we had to explore that a little bit because a lot of times we hear the word uh, decolonize. We hear the word decolonize. And a lot of times, but when we hear that word decolonize, it, we hear it as if, you know, we're getting rid of that colonized way of thinking, right? Get rid of that colonized way of thinking. But decolonization for us means a lot more than that because for us, we can't think about uh, getting away from something. When we think about it, even this circle right here tells us something, is that when we are born, we go a direction. And we go that direction to move toward, you know, this. Once we have birth, our movement is toward returning back to the creator, right? Our movement in this direction, right? So when we say decolonize, in a way, we think about going and undoing everything that we've experienced. It's not a sense of undoing because what we've experienced in our life made us who we are. I mean, even though we may not have had those traditional practices of rites of passage, we still had rites of passage, right? We still have rites of passage in so many different ways. And, and so when we start to look at indigenous belief, indigenous thinking. Indigenous thinking is a way of the, uh, of what we say without saying decolonizing, but it's a way of enhancing how we think that is in tune with our ancestral ways. Um, as you know, what's his, uh, I'm thinking of a, a doctor or a scientist who wrote the biology of belief. Maybe if anyone knows, you can put his name there in the comments. Uh, Bruce Lipton, there we go, Dr. Bruce Lipton wrote a biology of belief and this idea of how important our thinking is into our health, into how we handle situations, into how our body develops. And Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, he's known as one of the founding uh, scholars of epigenetics. So <clears throat> when we have a similar belief of epigenetics, which originally was called ghost, the ghost genes, right? But we had that spiritual type of insight 
uh, that we call, you know, ancestors. For example, we feel that our ancestors are still within us. Uh, some of the pain that we feel is the pain that our ancestor has. Some of that internal wisdom that we have is the wisdom that our ancestors had. It's, it's not something we had to go to class for. It's naturally within us, right? Uh, that idea of our environment and putting ourselves in that environment that allows that ancestral wisdom to come out, you know, that's consistent with the study of epigenetics, right? And so that's why we want to uh, really explore, well, what, what can we do to do that as far as our thinking? Because one of the things that's really kind of thrown us off is what we're experiencing now uh, with what's going on up here. And I think the more that we focus uh, about what's going on up here, the more it helps us relate to everything around us and help soothe what's going on in here, right? So um, part of that natural development that we've seen, and uh, are we still good? I hope that we're still good. I see a, a little going on. Can someone message me and let me know that I'm still on? Can everyone there still hear me? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Because on my screen, thank you, Michelle, on my screen, I'm getting that sign that says, oh, you're not on. Okay, well, I'll continue if you can hear me and everything. By the way, I just see someone there named Clark Ray. Uh, your name just stood out because of the not part uh, Ray. Because um, uh, Actually, it's Reed that I'm thinking of. I'm watching this documentary. I know it's off subject on Hulu on Aretha Franklin, and they call her Little Re. But man, it's such a good documentary because uh, didn't know a lot of the story about Aretha Franklin and didn't know a lot of story background about her family and what she went through. So it's an absolutely incredible documentary. Well, no, it's not a documentary. It's a uh, it's a biopic. Yeah, it's a biopic, but it's really good. Anyway, sorry to get off subject there, but I'm glad I'm still here with y'all. <laughs> and Michelle and Theta, glad to have you on. Man, I'm just happy to see names. I could just sit here and read names all day. This is awesome. But uh, <laughs> as we go into uh, this cycle right here, so what were some of the things that were being taught and what, were, um, what was this type of thinking? Well, we're gonna start off with what we call positive thinking positive thinking. And now I don't want it to sound like it's just this, you know, this phrase that we say all the time. Oh yeah. Positive thinking, just focus on the positive because positive thinking meant much more uh, for indigenous way of life. But positive thinking was about, think of it as productivity and proactive where they meet at. That's what positive thinking. So I always use this as an example, you know, this is more optimist thinking, and we've heard this sometimes saying that, okay, if the water was here, do you see it as half full or half empty? To me, to say, well, it's half full is optimist thinking. Optimist thinking is meaning that we want to think what we, we, we want it to be, our thinking wants to be in line with what we want. Okay, that's optimist thinking, and that's good. That's great. But we're talking about indigenous thinking and positive thinking. Positive thinking would look at this and say, how do I fill this up, <laughs> right? How do I fill that up? And there's a difference there. There is a difference there, all right? So for example, when we handle trauma, how we handle trauma, um, trauma, we would question trauma to say anything that would happen. Say if we had a death, a loss of a loved one, right? positive thing, if we apply optimist thinking in that type of uh, way, then we would think this, how are we going to get over this? Or are we able to get over this? I'm sorry. How are we, are we able to get over this? Right? Are we able to handle this loss? Positive thinking is, in, in indigenous terms is, what do we need to do to get over this? Right? So the positive thinking was done through practice. And what I mean practice is the things that are already aligned within the culture to help us go through these events, right? 
because we got to, you know, we got to look at is that when we look at our history, uh, our ancestral history and our history as people, it wasn't void of uh, trouble and trauma. We had lots of it. But what was in practice was how we dealt with those things. What was in practice is how we dealt with those things. And that's what true positive thinking is. So as we start to think about yourself and your thinking, you know, start to ask yourself a little bit of questions like, what is being proactive in our thinking? What is being proactive in our thinking? Well, an easy test for this is catching what you say and catching how you explain situations to other people. For example, let's say you go to work and you have a disagreement with your boss, right? When you leave that disagreement, the way you talk to yourself, do you say, uh, at, I felt like this, so this is what I did for myself? Or do we talk this way? My boss made me so mad, right? Because there's a difference. There's a difference. Uh, the first is proactive. It's understanding that this is the emotion that came up. And you know what? It's good to have emotion, right? But the proactive part of us is what are we going to do about that emotion? Okay. Then there's the reactive. And the reactive thinking is this person made me feel this way. Okay. Which we know can't be true. And how do we know that? Because if that was true, that would mean that our situations control our emotions. And if our situations control situations, then that means if we experience the same situation, then we would have the same emotion, which we don't. You could have two people involved with the same car accident. And one person could be angry and cuss out the world. And the other person could be thankful that nobody was hurt. Two completely different reactions to the situation, right? So again, that's where we have to really understand uh, proactive and, and start to look within our thinking as how did I develop that? How do I be a little bit more pro proactive in my thoughts? You know, well, the way that we do that is we use a lot of what's called I statements when we, when, when we talk about ourselves, right? We focus on what's in our circle of control, okay? And what's in our circle of control is everything that we can control right? Like how we react, the things we say, what we eat, right? Uh, um, how much time we're going to take to meditate today, how much time we're going to take to exercise today, the people that we're going to communicate with, people we're going to reach out to, our prayers, those are things that we have in control of, you know, even our work sometimes, you know, within our work, how we do our work, we have control over. Then there's things that are outside, of our control outside of our circle, right? And these are the things that we got to let ourselves go, uh, let it go, because we worry about these things way too much, right? Yes, I know this is troubling times. And when we hear those news stories, it really gets us fired up, but we got to let that go. Yes, we get upset when we go on Facebook and we see people commenting on something and we see all the negative comments. Yeah, that's really messed up, but we got to let it go. Right, because again, when those strike up emotion, emotion can be attached to the triggering situations or memories that we've been working so hard to heal from, right? And, and so that's why it's always good for us to understand having that being proactive about things. And a way of being proactive is if I notice that if I go to this website or this uh, 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 page on Facebook, and I see comments and they get me, well, being proactive is not going there anymore. If I have a friend who's constantly posting things that is getting me wired up, being proactive is, uh, I can put them on snooze, right? If on my way to work, I get upset, maybe there's a sign on my way to work. Well, how about I go another way or not look at the sign? So that's what we really talk about is being proactive. It's being in control and making it an intent for your morning. Once you wake up, that intent for you to be in control of, uh, of how you're gonna to react to certain things. And I know that to work. 
I know that to work. How is because when I really set out to have a good day, no matter what happens, I'm going to have a good day. Right. I'm going to have a good day. Um, and, and I and I always share a story about when I set my intentions to have a good day. And what happened? Beep. Right. Car accident. <laughs> and I stayed having a good day. And I asked the lady, because actually it was a, a little bump, wasn't anything major. She uh, hit me from behind. She's in the big Cadillac. So there was nothing there on her bumper and nothing there on my bumper. So I asked her and she was this uh, little elderly woman and she was already crying and you know my heart just went out to her. So I said, hey, how about this? Can we both go about our day and have a great day? Can you have a great day? Can you promise me you can have a great day? And I think I just surprised her by talking to her like that. And she was like, what? And then she said, yeah, I can have a good day. I said, all right, well, let's do that. Let's go our separate ways and have a good day. Um, Cause like I said, there was no damage. It was just a little boom, but of course, like, you know, this poor lady, but that's, you know, that's really being proactive in that. That's really being proactive in our thinking and set that intent. All right. So positive thinking is it's a good phrase but i like more using the phrase positive intent positive intent um so when we think you know when we hear about ancestors who wake up at when the sun rises to greet the sun that's the relationship with the sun right that's understanding the power of the sun that's being thankful and grateful to the sun right that's uh, an appreciation of life. And if you start your day with an appreciation of light, then what's your intent gonna be for the rest of that day, right? You're gonna celebrate life. And what is celebration of life? It's practically everything that we do. Everything that we do can be a celebration of life. Feeding your family is a celebration of life. Singing a song is a celebration of life. Burning your medicine is a celebration of life, right? So the power of positive intent can put us in a celeb uh, celebratory mode throughout the day, which is important because when we're celebrating, when we're feeling good, when we feel connected, we feel safe. And when we feel safe, we start to tune out those messages in our head that are constant reminders of how bad things can be. So when we lose intent, and positive intent in communities, what happens in communities, it gets replaced by what's called chronic negativity. You ever experienced that? Chronic negativity, right? And it's a collective conscious that no matter what we do, it's not gonna work out. No matter how hard we try to improve our quality of life, it's not gonna get better, right? No matter how hard I try, someone's going to pull me down, right? Um, and maybe my uh, um, Karina Walk, I, I'm going to need your help there with my uh, Karina Walters, I believe. Uh, she shared something that was I thought was really awesome because when we talk about that chronic negativity, we also, and uh, what we also call... Um, uh, 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 lateral violence, how we look to keep each other down when one of us tries to rise up, the others keep us down. Often the story is related to crabs in a bucket. And help me out there, Native Wellness Institute, I, I believe it is uh, Karina Walters. Um, I had the uh, awesome uh, privilege to hear her speak. And one of the things that she shared about was that are, uh, you know, if, if you study crabs, that's not really their behavior, right? Yes, if you trap crabs, if you put crabs in a certain situation, but we focus so much on that story, on the in the bucket story, that we don't focus on the attitude of the crabs and the behavior of the crabs, because when the behavior of the crabs in their natural habitat, in their natural environment, they take care of each other, all right? So I like to hear those stories because those stories tell us about something that we need to move toward and not something just to criticize 
to explore and say, yeah, that's how we are and not do anything about it, <laughs> right? And as we know, uh, here's the other part of indigenous thinking. Indigenous thinking is forward thinking. Indigenous thinking is forward thinking, meaning uh, it's never about going be back, okay? Now you might say, well, how come we're trying to decolonize? How is that forward thinking, right? But if you look at uh, uh, that circle of colonization, because colonization has a circle too, right? It's all forward. If this is where we started off, right? And we had this great fall of our culture, colonized, right? Far, furthest away that we can be from our original teachings. Well, if we keep moving forward in the circle, what happens? We go back to it, right? We go back to it. This is called a cycle. And a lot of our uh, native uh, elders and scholars have identified this period as the winter time, the winter time for our cultures, the winter time of our relations, right? So forward thinking means we're always moving forward in faith. And I really do believe we're on the rise. When you see more and more young people engage with their culture, and we see that, when you see more and more people involved with, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, the resurgence of the canoes and the drumming and the dances, I mean, that's really beautiful. And, and, and yes, Arnold, I'm, uh, the Mayan calendar, you know, Charlie, um, who uh, studied that, said the reason that people were so afraid of the Mayan calendar and, you know, the, the remember back um, 2012 and everything is supposed to end, he said, because people don't grasp the concept of cycle, right? They don't grasp the concept because in uh, Western civilization, the thinking process is uh, linear, beginning and end, right? It's linear, right? And that's why this idea is that um, we're always moving toward death rather than we're moving toward a rebirth, right? So yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. Thank you, Arnold. Um, so forward thinking, right? Yeah, and Theta, thanks, uh, Harold Belmont. Awesome, awesome, awesome uh, human being. So as we start to look at um, that way of thinking, which again, positive thinking and forward thinking and, 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 and how it's applied to where we're at right now. Well, forward thinking is healing, right? Forward thinking is healing. Forward thinking is allowing us to explore new emotions associated with old memories, right? Uh, that's what forward thinking allows us to do. Uh, because as we start to move forward in our healing, what we're really trying to work out and do is change the emotions or how we feel about, because we can't change our past, right? Once, uh, once we have that experience, it's a part of who we are, right? But where we derive our strength from is how do we handle those challenging issues in our life and what do we learn from them and how does that help us prosper as we continue to become elders, right? To become those wise, incredible elders. So that, you know, that forward thinking. And another thing about indigenous thinking and I thought was really cool is when we went to Australia, uh, one of the teachings they had, they share with us, uh, come from the emu and the kangaroo. And they use that in a lot of their teachings and their songs and their stories uh, particularly in talking about life and how we handle things because it's that indigenous teaching that um, through them is that the animals, the emu and the kangaroo cannot go backwards. They can only move forward, right? They can only move forward. So it's those friendly reminders. And I think it's awesome. It's awesome that we have these uh, natural world reminders about for us as people, what we need to do and, and to focus on that healing aspect of it to help us move forward. So um, I'm looking for something here. I was looking for a picture actually, but, uh, and yes, Lynette, love New Zealand. New Zealand, they're, they're just such awesome people there. Um, 
that really, when you think about the idea of, well, let, let's get to another thing. I'm glad that you brought up about New Zealand. All right. So another part of indigenous thinking is uh, the power of community healing, the power of community healing. And, you know, when, when you, when we think about what is healing, he, healing has to come from a point of when a person feels safe enough to be vulnerable, right? Healing has to come from when a person feels safe enough to feel, feel vulnerable. And if there's one thing that we learn from the natural world, animal, human, plant, we all feel our safest when we're surrounded by our community. We all feel our safest when we're surrounded by our community. And, and one of the things that when you brought up New Zealand, one of the things that came to mind was that uh, restorative justice in the programs that they have out there. So what we bared witness to was some of the youth who had gotten in trouble with the courts out there in some of the towns uh, above uh, Auckland. And rather than lock them up, <clears throat> they instructed the kids to spend some time at the with the Marai families, meaning the people and the Mara, the Marais are the Maoris, uh, what we would think is longhouses, you know, their their community uh, uh, houses that they gather to, for prayer, for service, uh, for ceremony. And the kids were uh, uh, um, sent there. The young people were sent there to learn about that, to take part of the Waka families or the Canoe families. Um, that's what restorative justice is, and it goes with that same insight of awakening that ancestral spirit, awakening ancestral spirit. So, I mean, talk about decolonizing, right? Is that restorative justice is going back to how do we restore these core values and principles? Because when we really study core values and principles in human development, there isn't violence there. There isn't savage there, you know, that's written in the history books, right? It's love. It truly is. It's love right it's love and through love what do we get well thank you gene right there gene puts it right there i was about to say what do we get from love it's all right there courage vulnerability that's what love allows us to do and to be right allows us and and we think about that Going back to uh, my first video of this, of uh, child development, that when our stories are filled with love, that's our core belief system. When our stories are filled with love, that's our, that's our systems right there, a belief. Beliefs that everything is involved with love because I truly believe that our ancestors led with love, meaning the decisions they made, they made with love. Which brings us to our next point of indigenous thinking. All right. Now I've seen some people call this big picture thinking, and I've seen some people call this futuristic thinking. We got a name for it. It's called seven generational thinking, right? Seven generational thinking. And what that is, uh, it means that our actions, our actions are always in line with the generations before us and the generations that will follow us. The generations that were before us and generations that will follow us. So when I hear stories about my ancestors on the Trail of Tears and all those stories just, you know, they give me goosebumps because I truly believe with every step they took was a prayer for me. With every step they took was a prayer for me. Now that Trail of Tears is the reason it's called Trail of Tears. The sorrow, the hurt, you know, the loss that was experienced being removed from your ancestral homes and having to walk that distance, you experience loss, you experience famine, hunger, illness, sickness, uh, something unlike they've experienced. But yet with every step was a prayer. And with every step is the reason that I'm alive today. It's the reason that all of my family is here. So that's what seven generational thinking is, right? Because <laughs> uh, 
yeah, a lot of it was emotional, but part of it was gas. <laughs> but that's what seven generational thinking is. It's, uh, um, it's in line with thinking about how our actions today are going to affect the generations to come. And again, it aligns with forward thinking. It aligns with proactive, positive thinking. Uh, it, it aligns with all of that uh, community healing. It aligns with all of that type of things. But when we think about seven generational thinking, you know, um, that's the big part of it because I believe is that um, that's in line with what science is telling us right now. Okay. So when science talks about epigenetics, <clears throat> We often were told, you know, 20 years ago, there's this belief is that, okay, if, you're, if, if your parents had this disease, you're going to get it. If your parents are alcoholic, you're going to be alcoholic. All right. Uh, and that it's even passed in your genes, in your DNA, you know. So if we look at genetically, all right, if we look at our genes, all right, so who can get diabetes? Well, right now there's a surge of diabetes within uh, the cat population, right? The cat, po domesticated cats, right? Domesticated cats. Now think about that. If the science of diabetes is that if your parents have it, you're gonna have it, all right? Um, and think about domest domesticated cats, all right? So does, that would have to mean that their lineage, their mothers and fathers carried this uh, diabetes gene that was given to them. Well, is it because of their parents were or is it because they're eating the scraps off of our tables, <laughs> right? Is it because they're developing a lifestyle that we introduced to them, right? So, that's why, you know, we really had to think about what that is. Now, naturally, we all have the genes for diabetes. We all do, all right? But those genes have to be activated and they're activated by what we do, right? What we do, our environment, what we eat, what we do with our bodies, how we heal, how we feel, how we deal with our emotions, right? All these diseases, right, has to do with how we're living our lives. And of course, if we grow up in the same environment that our parents grew up in, then we're going to be more susceptible to the lifestyle uh, and health conditions that our parents had, right? And I share that because I'm proof, because um, I had grandparents who at one time in their lives were alcoholics, Right. Um, but yet I have no relationship with alcohol. So somewhere in there, it, you know, if, if, if we go off that old data that says, oh, if your parents, you're going to be, or if you come from that, but my parents didn't allow alcohol in the home. My stories of childhood were never about seeing mom and dad drunk at home. Right. My stories were never seeing mom, dad come home and have a beer after work because alcohol wasn't in our home. I never opened the fridge and see more beer cans than food. I don't have those stories, all right? And my parents broke a cycle. They broke a cycle of lifestyle. So which means the things that have to do with alcohol, I don't have to worry about, okay? And I, and I bring that up because that, to me, that's the strong part of what seven generational thinking is, is the impact that you can have, the impact that you can have on your lineage for the next 70 years, 80 years. I mean, it's incredible when you think about it, but yet our ancestors knew this, right? They knew it. They prayed for us. They never met us. Well, maybe they did. <laughs> maybe in their dreams, they saw us. Maybe in their dreams, you know, when they lay down in their in, in, in their dwellings, in their teepees, wherever they might have slept, and they dreamed of us one day walking around with this device attached to our noses. Maybe they did dream of us, <laughs> right? But either way, they prayed for us. They prayed for us. 
And those prayers, you know, when we celebrate, when we celebrate life and we take care of ourselves, I mean, that's that original teaching, right? How we treat our bodies is our way of honoring our ancestors. That's a teaching, right? That's a teaching that's passed on. Uh, I mean, it allows us to really put in sight of what we're doing in the part of where we all fit in with that, with family, with tribe, with nation, right? So yeah, I think it's always so uh, exciting when you really think about that lifestyle and, and when, when you get a chance to uh, hear about the old stories and you get a chance to hear about how each tribe, how their healing practices and hearing stories about songs, it's so powerful, it really is because you realize is that, man, this is where we all relate at, these core values and these core principles of thinking about the world as a whole, right? Now, if you want to look at this idea too of uh, connection, right? So another way of thinking is uh, connectivity thinking. And what that means is how we're all connected with everything, how we're all connected with everything. So what we really, really start to see that is that relationships that we have, not only with each other, but the relationships we have with this, right? And how we look at this and how we use it and how we see these big mountains and apply those mountains as a spiritual place uh, for us to connect to, how we can breathe that air. We used to say when we breathe that air, you know, we're breathing in our ancestors. And what science is finding out is that's actually true. Uh, when they look at certain gases such as argon, which is in our air, um, cannot be destroyed. It just gets recycled. So we literally are breathing the same air as our ancestors. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing to think our, our, that our, our people were already in tune with that. So when we start to uh, look at these principles here of uh, that being connected, being connected, then that means when, we, when we're by water and we pray, there's a sense that that water is a conductor of love because our prayers are filled with love, right? And think of how many of our people have water ceremonies, right? Think about when the child is in the womb, surrounded by water, by love, right? Surrounded by a resonating in love. I mean, those are important aspects of life that we have to believe and think about why we sit down that when we say a prayer, we're actually giving love to our food. We're actually giving love to our water, our beverage, whatever we're drinking. That's why I always like to say, you know, that's actually that teaching right there is what got me away from drinking sodas. I had a real bad soda. Uh, I wouldn't, okay, I'll call it addiction. <laughs> I don't want to be in denial because uh, look, if I'm drinking it every day, yeah, I guess that's an addiction. I had a soda addiction meaning I drank it for lunch and for dinner, right? Um, and whenever I got thirsty. In Arizona, you get thirsty a lot. And, uh, but that teaching right there was that what if, and it wasn't a what if, uh, how it was told to me, but it's how I processed. Because it was told to me with certainty. It was told to me with certainty, right, this teaching. But it's my mind at the time, my colonized mind at the time, questioning this teaching and that teaching is is that creators messages and instructions on your well-being is placed in that water so when it rains the instructions right when that rain gets into the soil and our food grows from there the instructions in that food and when we eat that food the instructions that goes to our body that tells every cell in our body to be well, right? So there's truth in that teaching. And at the time I looked at it, what if that was true? Now I look at it, yes, there's a definite behind that. So water, what if water had all that? So as I drink, started to drink more water, again, I wasn't trying to move away from soda. I was moving toward drinking more water, forward thinking, right? Because I wanted to hear those messages from the creator. And I started to drink more and more water. 
it was about three months out before someone brought it to my attention that I hadn't drink soda in all that time. Isn't that amazing? Where you weren't, I wasn't even focused on that. But that's how our brain works, right? Our brains in line with forward thinking. And whatever you bring into focus, whatever you put into the circle is what you're going to focus on. So if you try to bring things in here that you don't want. So when we say things like, oh, I'm never going to be like my parents, doesn't it always seem like you end up like your parents? Well, why is it? Because you're focusing on the negative behaviors of parents or what you see as negative behaviors of parents. And if they stay within that circle, that's what you're focused on. And that's what you're moving forward toward, toward right? So, <laughs> so and, and by the way, I want to be like my parents. I mean, you should see how healthy they are right now. You should see my mom. Well, she, you can see my mom. She did a power hour. She did workout. Uh, you got to check that out. <laughs> uh, but going back to what you're saying is that, so that forward thinking of focusing on those instructions from that water. And I thought about this. How could I read those instructions if they're clouded with corn syrup and, 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 and sugar and all that other stuff that's dumped into soda, right? <laughs> it's like, how could I read it? <laughs> it's like trying to read a book when all the words are, are out of it, right? So that's where I just really wanted to, um, for myself at the time, put my focus, just take this uh, uh, teaching that goes along with this water and, and receive those messages. And I found a new appreciation for swimming. I had quit swimming at that time. And now like just to be in water, put my feet in water. I know you're all like that, right? And there's little messages that come through water. By the way, for those of you that are work out and stay active, here's a little uh, thing with water, particularly water and grass, because there's a relationship between water and grass, right? There's life there, there's resurgence there, all right? That activates as soon as that water hits the grass, there's an energy there. So recovery time, what is recovery? Recovery is when you work out and how long does it take for you to move past the sore muscle so you can work out again? Here's a little tip. Take off the socks and shoes and stand in wet grass and it'll recharge your body. It'll recharge, uh, get that flow, that energy of uh, vibrant flow that new energy, right? That'll help put your body it to, uh, to, to activate your body to uh, recover at a faster rate. So that's a little tip for all your athletes. <laughs> use it, use it. So uh, there's one other thing I wanna talk about as far as thinking and, um, and one of it is our ability to adapt. Our ability to adapt. So, that's one of the reasons that kind of caught us on with uh, colonization because our ability to adapt has went in really crucial with how we got to where we are now, right? Our ability to adapt, and I'm not talking about survival mode or survival tactics, but our ability to adapt uh, with when, when it meets survival mode it puts us in a place that the best way to keep us safe and the best way is to assimilate. That when it's in with survival mode of this idea that if we don't assimilate, those that we love the most or what we love most in life will be destroyed. That's, that's a pretty powerful tool. And it's something that was already predetermined. Remember uh, uh, the genocide, other side, all that, that wasn't by accident, right? That was a plan. That was a strategic event that was meant to have um, a generational effect, right? So we have to acknowledge it. We have to acknowledge it. So but adapt, adaptation though is really about, it's about when something happens, right? How, to, how do we restore and bring balance back? How do we restore and bring balance back? So we had to adapt. There are times, maybe famine, maybe drought, uh, maybe something happened where we had to adapt to certain things. Uh, our people adapt so well, we, we think of it as resiliency uh, at times, but we had to adapt. And our people are willing to do that. When you lead by love 
it, it, it's a, it's almost a no brainer, right? When you lead by love, it's almost a no brainer. And, and I, I think that is that that mode of adaptation is how we need to look at how we have to survive today. Um, Cause one thing that we acknowledge too, is that as we move forward, what we're moving forward to isn't behaviors, exact behaviors like our ancestors. It's what we're moving toward is values by shared, uh, our, that uh, was shared by our ancestors, right? Um, the, you know, just like uh, um, Charlie talked about is that this right here is the medicine we use to heal, right? But what is the shell? The shell is what carries the medicine, right? Well, Zoom, Facebook, this technology, that's a shell, right? Is how we choose to use it. This shell has many purposes. Who, uh, and the original purpose of shells, as we know, in the animal world is housing. But we take it and we put our medicine on it. Well, this is the medicine, the sharing that we do, the smiles that you put on here, the good messages, that's the medicine. And this technology is carrying the medicine, right? That's a good example of indigenous way of adaptability, right? Is what do we do to carry the message of healing? And what do we do to carry the message of wellness and carry the message of, of community healing, right? So that's what I mean when we talk about uh, adapting. And for our people, uh, one thing that stayed in my mind is I remember one uh, uh, years ago, I was at a white bison conference and I heard someone talk about, use this terminology of ancestors creating ceremony to meet the needs of the people, right? And it made me think, wow, what are the future generations? What type of ceremonies are they gonna create, right? What type of future generations are they going to create? Yet at some point I hear there's thinking that as if our young people are not allowed to create ceremony, right? That our young people have to find the way that uh, the people before them did it and utilize that, which may or may not work in today's environment. Um, but again, I think, uh, I think this, and just about, uh, again, the seven generational thinking and, 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 uh, adaptability is we pray and pray and pray for our next generations. And we pray for them to be strong, to be better, to have better lives than we did. We pray for them to, to, to step up and be the leaders and, and, and be the people that we need to heal our communities. So we pray for that, right? We really pray for that. But the question is, what is our reaction when they do step up, right? What is our reaction when, we, when they do step up? So I don't wanna get into this big philosophical question about it, but it's something we have to really dig in and think about because they are stepping up. And the things that they're doing today is new to a lot of people in my generation. Generation Z is doing things that, you know, the, the boomer generation hasn't done. That even, I guess, what am I? Am I, I always forget what mine is. I'm X, right? Generation X. <laughs> right? They're doing things different. We're doing things different. So, that's what we have to be aware of is that, yes, our prayers will be answered, but we have to be willing and ready for them to be answered in that way and trust that. Um, and I trust our next generation. Why? Because I believe they're the younger generations are more open, more compassionate, more loving than my generation. And I'm sorry if you're in my generation, you feel offended. These are my, this is my opinion. So I think that but we also, I think our generation needs to take credit in too in allowing that to happen and allowing that to happen by being great mentors and teachers and parents and aunties and uncles and coaches and the things that we're doing out there to support that younger generation. I think we're doing great things. I mean, majority of what I get on my feed now are opportunities for young people. And that's so important. And it's so beautiful to see that we're all participating in this. 
but uh i see my time is coming there man i had like 10 more hours say eh? um hey so this weekend i want you to do me a favor and uh, i want to challenge you to do something and this is it's not from an indigenous person but it's from someone we all know his name is mr rogers you know mr rogers you know uh um it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood that guy well he had this what he called a, a one minute meditation and it's a beautiful beautiful activity sometime this week take one minute and time yourself take one minute and in that minute just focus focus on all the people who have loved you in your life And I'm trying to think of all the words that he said, because he said it in such a beautiful way. Who loved you into loving, who laughed you into laughing, who cared you into caring. One minute to think of all those people and what a great medicine and tool that is for us during a time like this. But that's my time. Thank you for spending this day with us. And Mr. Rogers was Cherokee. Thank you, Theta. Awesome. Hey, uh, and hey, if you enjoyed this, join us next week. We have two really incredible trainings. We have self-care at home and work. Uh, that's on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we have a power. We're going to, uh, if you like this presentation in particular, we're going to do a power of positive thinking two-day session on that and that's going to be on Wednesday oh wait Thursday and Friday of next week so these are all coming up next week go to nativewellness.com for more information on that but I know you'll love it because it's not just myself but all my team like Dita and Jean who have uh, been on here you know we're all going to be there please join us I'm sure that you'll have a great great time so but oh have a beautiful day we'll see you next time take care bye